It's easy to imagine that the Earth is at the centre of the universe, or that there's something really special about it. Earth is special to us, because we live here. But on a universal scale, it's just like any other lump of rock. The demotion of Earth from anything special is taken to its logical conclusion with the cosmological principle. The cosmological principle states that on a large scale the universe is homogeneous, every part is the same as every other part, and isotrophic. Everything looks the same in every direction, so it doesn't have a centre. Until the 1930s, cosmologists believed that the universe was infinite in both space and time, that is, it had always existed, and static. This seemed the only way it could be stable using Newton's law of gravitation. Even Einstein modified his theory of general relativity to make it constant with the steady-state universe. In the 1820s, though, an astronomer called Olbers noticed a big problem with this model of the universe. If stars or galaxies are spread randomly throughout an infinite universe, then every possible line of sight must contain a star. Calculations show that this would make the whole night sky uniformly bright. This problem is called Olbers Paradox, and clearly there's a contradiction between an infinite and a static universe. The Doppler effect. The motion of a wave source affects its wavelength. Imagine an ambulance driving past you. As it moves towards you, its siren sounds higher pitched, but as it moves away, its pitch is lower. This change in frequency and wavelength is called the Doppler shift. The frequency and the wavelength change because the waves bunch together in front of the source and stretch out behind it. The amount of stretching or bunching together depends on the velocity of the source. This happens with light too. When a light source moves away from us, the wavelengths become longer and the frequencies become lower. This shifts the light towards the red end of the spectrum and is called redshift. When a light source moves towards us, the opposite happens and the light undergoes blue shift. Hubble realized that the universe is expanding. The spectra from galaxies all show redshift, so they're all moving away from us. The amount of redshift gives recessional velocity, how fast the galaxy is moving away. Plotting recessional velocity against distance shows that they're proportional, i.e. the speed that galaxies move away from us depends on how far away they are. This suggests that the universe is expanding and gives rise to Hubble's law. Recessional velocity equals Hubble's constant times the distance. The expanding universe gives rise to the hot Big Bang model. The universe is expanding and cooling down, so further back in time it must have been smaller and hotter. If you trace time back far enough, you get a hot Big Bang. The hot Big Bang theory. The universe started off very hot and very dense, perhaps as an infinitely hot, infinitely dense singularity. It has been expanding ever since. If the universe began at a specific point in time, then it must have a finite age. The age and observable size of the universe depend on Hubble's constant. If the universe has been expanding at the same rate for its whole life, the age of the universe must equal 1 over Hubble's constant. This gives a very simple solution to Olber's paradox. If the observable universe is finite, then there's absolutely no reason why every line of sight should include a star. Actually, most of them don't. Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation The hot Big Bang model predicts that lots of electromagnetic radiation was produced in the very early universe. This radiation should still be observed today. Because the universe has expanded, the wavelengths of this cosmic background radiation have been stretched and are now in the microwave region. Cosmic microwave background radiation was picked up accidentally by Penzias and Wilson in the 1960s. 
In the late 1980s, a satellite called the Cosmic Background Explorer was sent up to have a detailed look at the radiation. It found a continuous spectrum corresponding to a temperature of around 3 Kelvin. The radiation is largely isotrophic and homogeneous, which confirms the cosmological principle. There were very tiny fluctuations in temperature, which were at a limit of COBE's detection. These are due to tiny and energy density variations in the early universe, and are needed for the initial seeding of galaxy formation. The background radiation also shows a Doppler shift, indicating the Earth's motion through space. It turns out that the Milky Way is rushing towards an unknown mass, the Great Attractor, at over a million miles an hour. Gravity warps space and time. According to general relativity, gravity works by changing the shape of space and time. To reduce the brain ache a bit, you can imagine the universe as a two-dimensional surface that's warped in three dimensions. This is a handy way of getting an idea of what's going on, but be careful. Space-time actually has four dimensions, x, y, z, and time. On a big scale, there are three ways that gravity can warp the universe. The universe can be flat, open, or closed. The curvature of space-time determines the eventual fate of the universe. The amount of curvature depends on the average density of the universe. The density required for the universe to be flat is the critical density. If the average density equals the critical density, then the universe is flat. If the average density is less than the critical density, then the universe is open. And if the average density is more than the critical density, then the universe is closed. With a bit of mathematical jiggery-pokery, you can get an equation for the critical density of the universe in terms of the Hubble constant. The three possible types of curvature give three possible fates of the universe. In an open universe, gravity, controlled by the density, is too weak to stop the expansion. The universe will just keep expanding forever. In a closed universe, gravity is strong enough to stop the expansion and start the universe contracting again, ending up with a big crunch. In a flat universe, gravity is just too strong to stop the expansion at t equals infinity, so the universe expands forever, but more and more slowly with time. We can't calculate the age of the universe until we know its density. A reasonable estimate for the age of the universe is found from t equals 1 over Hubble's constant, but this formula assumes that the universe has been expanding at the same rate for its whole lifetime. In fact, if we look at the graph of size against time, the expansion rate of the universe is slowing down, even for the open universe, so in the past, the universe was expanding faster than it was now. That means that we've overestimated the time it's taken for the universe to get to the size it is now. The more dense the universe is, the younger it must be. If you include all the dark matter and dark energy that's been detected indirectly, current estimates of the actual density of the universe aren't very far off the critical density. The story so far. Before 10 to the minus 4 seconds after the Big Bang, this is mainly guesswork. There are plenty of theories around, but not much experimental evidence to back them up. The general consensus at the moment goes something like this. Big Bang to 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Well, it's anyone's guess really. At this sort of size and energy, even general relativity stops working properly. This is the infinitely hot, infinitely small, infinitely dense bit. 10 to the minus 43 seconds to 10 to the minus 4 seconds. At the start of this period, there's no distinction between different types of force. There's just one grand unified force. Then the universe expands and cools, and the unified force splits into gravity, strong nuclear, weak nuclear, and electromagnetic forces. Many cosmologists believe that the universe went through a rapid period of expansion called inflation at about 10 to the minus 34 seconds. The universe is a sea of quarks, antiquarks, leptons, and photons. The quarks aren't bound up in particles like protons and neutrons because there's just too much energy around. 
At some point, matter-antimatter symmetry gets broken, so slightly more matter is made than antimatter. Now we're on more solid ground, 10 to the minus 4 seconds. This corresponds to a temperature of about 10 to the 12 Kelvin. The universe is cool enough for quarks to join up to form particles like protons and neutrons. They can never exist separately again. Matter and antimatter annihilate each other, leaving a small excess of matter and huge numbers of photons resulting in a cosmic background radiation that we observe today. At about 100 seconds, temperature is cooled to 10 to the 9 Kelvin. The universe is similar to the interior of a star. Photons are cool enough to fuse to form helium nuclei. After about 300,000 years, temperature is cooled to about 3,000 Kelvin. The universe is cool enough for electrons that were produced in the first millisecond to combine with helium and hydrogen nuclei to form atoms. The universe becomes transparent since there are no free charges for photons to interact with. This process is called recombination. About 14 billion years, which is about now, temperature has cooled to about 3 Kelvin. Slight density fluctuations in the universe mean that, over time, clumps of matter have been condensed by gravity into galactic clusters, galaxies and individual stars. You have been listening to Reginald S. Jones from the Staines Community College. I hope you have enjoyed this educational supplement as much as I have. It has been absolutely thrilling. Goodbye, and I hope you have a very, very fine day.